Hi everyone. In this video we will make our first observation of indeterminate limits and more particularly we will look at a technique to solve these limit forms which involves factoring and cancelling. All limits we had seen in prior sections were determinate, meaning that their result was clearly identifiable, whether it was a finite number or an infinite number. In this section, we're going to focus on one particular situation where the limit's result is not clear-cut at all. More specifically, we're going to focus on strategies where direct substitution produces a 0 over 0 form. Now remember, 0 over 0 will be very different from infinite limits that result from, for instance, a k over 0 form. So strategy number one will be for us to use factoring and cancelling. So suppose f and g are polynomials such that f and g calculated at a will give 0. By polynomials, remember we're talking about expressions that involve powers of x added or subtracted to one another, where the powers are integer or positive integer values. So these are a few examples of what we're looking at. Now the limit as x approaches a of the quotient f of x over g of x will reveal the indeterminate form 0 over 0 by direct substitution if in fact f and g at a are 0. Observe that the domain of the rational function excludes x equals 0 which is why direct substitution does not provide a determinate result. So an efficient strategy is to factor f of x and g of x and to cancel their common factor x minus a. Okay, so now I can almost hear one of you in the back saying, but sir, how do we know that x minus a will be a common factor to both f and g? Remember, this is guaranteed by the factor theorem, which was discussed in the review material of the course. Now, the factor theorem said that if a polynomial calculated at a is 0, then x minus a has to be a factor of p of x. So, according to the factor theorem, if f, of a, if f at a is 0, then f of x will be the product of x minus a times p1 of x, so a, a polynomial of one degree lower. And in the same manner, g of x can be expressed as x minus a times p2, a polynomial that is one degree less than g of x was originally. So p1 and p2 represent polynomials themselves as f and g did. Therefore, what will happen is the limit as x approaches a of the quotient f over g can be replaced by the limit as x approaches a with the factored forms that we'll get for f and g, including the common x minus a's. Cancelling the x common, the x minus a, reduces the limit to the quotient of p1 over p2 as we do the limit x going towards a. Then we compute the ensuing limit and hopefully by direct substitution, we will get a determinate result this time. Same person as before in the background saying, uh, wait, sir. If g at a is 0, then the quotient f over g is undefined at x equals a. So why are you just allowed to eliminate common x minus a factors? Isn't there a restriction to impose when we do this kind of simplification? Now remember that computing the limit of a function as x approaches a is not the same as evaluating the function at x equals a. In fact, doing the limit means we are not at x equals a at all. We're only getting closer to it, but we are still a certain distance away from a. So we are not breaking any rules. We are not using the function's value at a point where it, is, where it is undefined yet. So f of x over g of x is actually identical to the quotient p1 over p2 in the vicinity, but not at 
x equals a. But that's fine enough when we're talking about limits. For instance, let's evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 3x over x squared minus 2x minus 3. First uh, step is always to attempt direct substitution, and a quick calculation will show that both the numerator and the denominator are actually equal to 0 when x is replaced by 3. So we are faced with a 0 over 0, so an indeterminate form, when applying direct substitution. The factor theorem, however, reminds us that x minus 3 will definitely be a factor for both of these expressions. So, factoring at the numerator by uh, using simple factoring and at the bottom by using the sum product method, we can find x minus 3 as a common term. And through cancellation, we then have a reduced limit as x approaches 3 for the, quote, for the rational function x over x plus 1 to compute. This expression can be calculated by direct substitution to provide a result of 3 over 4. Second example, we have a limit as x approaches 2 of the quotient of two cubic expressions, x cubed minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 8, and at the denominator, x cubed minus 6x squared plus 12x minus 8. Once again, if you try direct substitution, you will find a zero outcome for both the numerator and the denominator when x is replaced by 2. So once again, we are faced with a 0 over 0 form after applying direct substitution. The factor theorem will guarantee that x minus 2, however, will be a factor of both polynomials found at the numerator and denominator respectively. As a matter of fact, we can find x minus 2 as a factor in the numerator by grouping. So notice that each pair of terms has an x minus 2 in common, and then we can proceed by simple factoring to extract the x minus 2. So the numerator reduces to x minus 2 times x squared plus 4. As for the denominator, it may not be as simple to proceed by grouping. In fact, grouping will fail. So perhaps you can do a quick synthetic division to figure out who x minus 2 must be the factor of, or must be the multiplier of. Okay, so at the, in the first row, we've put the coefficients of the third degree polynomial that we're trying to factor. 2 is a known 0 for this third degree polynomial, and the ensuing result of synthetic division provides us with the quadratic x squared minus 4x plus 4. In other words, the denominator can be factored into x minus 2 times x squared minus 4x plus 4. So, using the work we've just done, we have a replacement for the original limit that we set off to calculate. The common factor is x minus 2 can be eliminated since the limit is not taking place at 2, but rather as we head towards 2. And if we observe that the denominator is actually a perfect square, direct substitution can now be applied and will provide an 8 over 0 plus form. 0 plus because at the bottom we have a perfect square, so there is no chance of obtaining any result that will be negative. So approaching 2 from the left or the right will provide a 0 result or approaches 0, but with still slightly positive values. As we saw in our previous sections, this kind of quotient will go to plus infinity. So from our previous result, we can deduce that the rational function has x equals 2 as a vertical asymptote, seeing that the limit as we approach 2 has revealed infinite, an infinite discontinuity, an infinite behavior. Graphically, here's what we would observe. 
the left and right hand limits as we approach 2 both produced a positive infinite result which explains the function heading upwards from both sides of 2. So this is a really interesting problem because although we had a 0 over 0 form the outcome did not necessarily produce a, a limited or a finite answer. We can still get a vertical asymptote or we can still detect a vertical asymptote following a 0 over 0 form.